Right. Welcome back. Uh, my name is uh, Gautam Shanoi. Uh, I work for AMD, and uh, uh, this is this is a work that I've done along with Pratik Nayak, a new college graduate who joined us recently. And uh, this we want to discuss some of the scheduling challenges on uh, split LLC architectures uh, that that we've that we've been observing in the last few uh, months. Uh, there were more problems, but you know, thanks to the efforts of the community, we have been able to make progress. Uh, thanks to Mel, we've seen the new my imbalance issue being fixed, but there are still a lot, lot more uh, challenges out there which we would like to uh, discuss and see what are the options that we have to uh, address them. So, uh, to give you a quick context, by split LLC and unified LLC, I, I mean that by unified LLC, I mean uh, the last level cache being at the uh, level of a socket. So if you see the SCED domain hierarchy for these kinds of uh, processes, it's going to be the SMT domain. Then you have the MC domain, which models the LLC. And then if it's a multi-socket system, you have a NUMA domain. Whereas for a split LLC, you will have SMT, MC, which is the group, of course, which share uh, the last level cache, L3 cache. And then you have the DAI, which basically has multiple such uh, MC domains, multiple such LLCs. And then you have the NUMA. So uh, that's the difference. If, if you want to compare it side by side, I, I should have had a slide, but um, I'm just showing you with the diagram here. So some of the challenges are, are classic challenges with respect to the problem of consolidation versus spread, right? I mean, there are certain classes of workloads that like to be consolidated, and there are certain classes of workloads that like to spread. So I just want to talk about three such problems and why we are not able to make the right decision currently, and what is it that we can do to sort of address this problem. So for the problem of you know wanting to consolidate but not being able to, I, we use the example of SCH Bench. SCH Bench has, in, in this word variant, we have a messenger thread and a bunch of worker threads. And uh, the messenger basically work, wakes up the workers. And when workers are done, they wake up the messenger. And what we measure is the tail latency. And what we've seen is we get the best tail latency when the messengers and the workers are in the same last level cache. They are running in the same LLC. Uh, and when that does not happen, you see a very bad latency. So in a, in a good case to a bad case, we've seen like uh, two point, I mean, it, it's, 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 if, if, it's, if it's one normalized in, in good case, uh, it, it, it is as bad as 2.5 in, in the bad case. And it, it's not that the scheduler today, uh, you know, does not make use of any hints to sort of uh, try to bias the way key towards the waker in the wake-up path, we use the WF sync flag. And when that happens, and when we know that the run queue length is only one, which means that the waker is going to go away, we try to wake up the wakey you know, on the same LLC. So that's that's the hint where we already use. But uh, in, in the case of SCH bench, it uses Futex to signal uh, the, the workers and the messengers. And WF sync flag does not feature here. So what happens is when you initially create this workload, you have, because of the way we do initial placement, you'll have the messengers and workers you know, being spread across all the different LLCs. And then uh, we would like them to consolidate, but because we don't have any appropriate signal, they'll continue to be woken up wherever they last ran. right? But consolidation does happen. It's not because of a conscious choice, but it is because of a noise. So what, what we observed was the reason for this run-to-run uh, uh, -run variance is really how quickly the consolidation happens. If, you, if the consolidation happens earlier, your tail latency is less as opposed to when it happens much later on. And the reason why we observed when we analyzed you know, why is the consolidation not happening at, in, a, in a deterministic manner, the consolidation is happening in the new idle load balancer case, especially when, the, when you have a K worker or some kernel thread pop up, and that has to be a per CPU kernel thread because it cannot be migrated. It, it pops up on one of the CPUs where the SCH bench worker is currently running. And, and at the same time, the messenger goes idle. And in the new idle load balancer case, it detects that, hey, there is an imbalance here. Uh, I have zero tasks locally, but there are two tasks out there. I cannot move the pinned K worker or the kernel thread. So let me move the SCH bench worker. So that's how the migration happens. But really, we are at the mercy of this noise you know, uh, to, to help us uh, do the consolidation. And uh, there is enough noise. It's not that it's not there. It's just that it's not deterministic. And it's not, we are not that we are doing this consolidation uh, um, consciously. So, so this is one problem where you know, uh, 
in the absence of any specific uh, uh, heuristics that tell the scheduler that these two are communicating tasks, we do not end up communicating thereby hurting uh, the performance. Uh, and, and, and in case where, where the consolidation does happen, since it does not happen deterministically, we see a run to run variance, which is also not the ideal case. So this is, this is the problem where consolidation is preferred, but we do not get it. Uh, the next problem is uh, with respect to the case where we would ideally like the workload to be spread out because the workload is a bandwidth constrained workload. So the example that we've chosen here is uh, that of the stream workload. So consider the case where we have a uh, two socket uh, uh, third generation Epic system where this, this test was carried down. It, it has uh, eight LLCs per socket. So, you, so you, in total you have 16 LLCs. So I, if I start a stream uh, application with 16 stream threads, Thanks to Mel's latest uh, uh, enhancements, we are in most cases able to you know, spread it out and make sure that each LLC has only one stream task because that's ideally what we want. We don't want more than one stream task on the same LLC, they'll be thrashing each other's cache and that's not an ideal situation. However, consider the case that we have you know, placed the first 15 stream tasks on each of the LLCs and there was, I mean, in the diagram there, you can see there's a, there is a uh, LLC that is, has a blue colored thing. Some, some oddball task was running at that point in time. So what we do in the initial placement is we compare the number of idle CPUs uh, in, in the two domains when we are trying to compare and find out which is the idlest domain. And then since the number of idle CPUs are the same, what we do is we end up waking it up on the LLC of the parent where, where the parent is currently running. And in such a case, you will have two stream threads on the same LLC, which is LLC zero. And, and that blue thing can go away. I mean, it, it's probably going to go away. It's just a noise, but that's going to go away. But because of the way we have this NUMA imbalance thresholds, we will, because the difference is nine and seven, which is less than or equal to two, it will never equalize, right? So throughout this run, this is what the situation is going to remain. And hence, in this case, we'll see a very bad throughput. And this is responsible for the run to run variance. Now, previously, we were not seeing this because before Mel made these changes, uh, it was bad in all cases. We would end up consolidating all of these onto a single new node. It would not even go to the other new node, and it was uniformly bad. But uh, after Mel's changes, we start, started seeing very, very good numbers uh, in, the, in the good cases. But there are these oddball cases where we do see uh, bad numbers. So we, I mean, uh, based on the heuristics that we have currently, and then we try to see if some other signals can be used to break the tie. We tried using something like group utilization, which is the utilization of all the cores in the group to see if we can break the tie and then move the task towards the one which has a lower utilization. Now, this was good for stream in most cases, not all cases, but it was causing regressions on other benchmarks which preferred consolidation, like Hackbench was not happy with this. Uh, so yeah, so, so this, was, this was another issue where spread was preferred, but we could not spread early enough or, or consistently enough, and that caused uh, caused a, a, a regression when it was not expected. And the final example that I have here, uh, I'm using T-Bench, uh, where basically we have this thundering herd sort of a problem on a uh, on a two socket system that we can observe. So basically, T-Bench, uh, uh, you can spawn n number of clients, and then you have the T-Bench server which basically pairs each client with each server thread. So you have pairs of clients and servers that are communicating via TCP, right? So ideally you just like these client and servers to be co-located. I mean, but, but it's all right if you can spread them out as long as the client and servers are co-located. Uh, however, this has an interesting property that when the client sort of is initially placed, it goes immediately to sleep. It waits for all the clients to come up. So you've placed it on LLC zero, Right, because that was the idlest LLC probably, it goes to sleep. So the number of, uh, I mean, you have enough number of idle uh, CPUs there. So that when the next client wakes, I mean, initially it has to be placed, it'll again be very likely placed on the same LLC. It goes to sleep and that happens consistently until all the clients have been started. And then all of a sudden, everybody wakes up. They're all there. And then you have to rely on the load balancer to sort of, you know, move them uh, efficiently across. And when you have, a uh, and this is what the distribution, initial distribution looks like. So you can see that uh, in, in, in the table there, a lot of the tasks were on LLC 14 and 15. 
initially, right? I mean, that's what the distribution was like. And it was all on one Numa node consisting of uh, LLCs 8 to 15. And uh, uh, the distribution was something like 17% and 82% initial task placement. And we counted that we need something like 10,000 migrations before we could get to a semblance of equality. I mean, we cannot get perfect equality, but uh, to get there, right? And in case, I mean, if, if there's a way by which we could uh, place, get the initial placement right in this case, we saw that uh, we could observe something like 20% improvement when we had 64 clients, 12% uh, improvement in the 128 clients, and this is, this is consistently being observable. So when we are initially placing the task, we, I mean, uh, scheduler has no history of what, what the task is, and it has, it tries to do the best it can, right? And in this case, uh, because of the nature of the workload, it tries to beat that. I mean, because it goes to sleep and then wakes up uh, eventually when all the tasks are there. So you have this thundering herd problem which the scheduler could not have predicted. So try as hard as we do today. We are not able to completely uh, get what the workload really wants. And then we, we do use uh, as uh, the heuristics as best as we can, but that's still not sufficient. So another interesting thing that we observed is, you know, one of the differences between a unified LLC and a split LLC is that uh, because the L3 cache is at the socket domain, since if you have autonuma uh, running, uh, if there are a pair of tasks that are spread across two NUMA domains that uh, uh, you know communicate with each other, very likely they are going to be using the same set of pages. So autonuma would pull them together, right? And as a result, they get the side effect of using the unified LLC out there, but unified cache out there. Whereas on split LLC, Autonuma at best can co-locate them onto the same node, but it does not guarantee that they'll be in the same LLC domain. So that's where Autonuma's effect ends. So that's another sort of uh, a shortcoming. And of course, I mean, there is another advantage that when you have a task that is waking up, we in the wake up logic, we use the MC domain to figure out if there is an idle core or an idle CPU. Uh, in the unified LLC domain, you have a higher probability because there are a lot more CPUs there. You have a higher probability of finding an idle CPU, though it comes with its own set of problems. I think Chen Yu is going to talk about that uh, in, the, in the next talk. But in, in split LLC, I mean, you are limited. I mean, the search space is limited. So if you don't have an idle core out there, you're just going to pile on behind uh, you know, one of the busy, on, onto one of the busy run queues, and then you have to hope for the load balancer to move you around. So, these are uh, uh, some of the observations that we had that we would, you know, uh, there is no way currently that the scheduler can detect, you know, whether it prefers spread or whether it prefers, whether the workload prefers uh, consolidation. And uh, the, the negative impact is particularly high when you have this split LLC because then you end up paying a penalty when you get the displacement decision uh, incorrect. So what have we tried out? Well, uh, sometime, after uh, last LPC, Peter mentioned that, I think it was one of the threads where we were trying to optimize wake wide, uh, that you know, we are not sure whether adding more heuristics is going to improve the situation because uh, a heuristic may favor one class of workloads, but it's definitely going to be biasing against another class of workloads. So is it possible, I mean, that, that we can look at some hints from the user space? I mean, latency nice is what Vincent spoke about in terms of latency, and Peter enumerated a bunch of hints uh, out there, whether it's energy efficient, background, and so on and so forth. So can we use this mechanism of hinting from the user space to help the scheduler make better decisions? I mean, especially if the workload knows what is it that it wants. Uh, if, if we do get a hint, it's, it's not necessary that the scheduler has to honor the hint all the time. But in case where it is possible, right? Uh, can we make better placement decisions in case we get some hints from the user. So what we explored was uh, a very simple model out here. This is just, this is, this is not meant for inclusion. We've sent out the RFC patches this is just to spark some discussion here. Uh, during the initial placement, you could, because the scheduler has no history of what the task has been doing, if we get a hint saying that, hey, this is what we, we prefer, we prefer to be spread away from the parent or we, prefer to be you know, consolidated close to the parent. And similarly, during the subsequent wake up, do you want to be woken up closer to the waker or do you want to you know, remain where you previously ran? So if we get some, some hints like this, does it help uh, uh, you know, the, the, the workload? So we enumerated uh, all possible combinations for these workloads. There's some of that we've been investigating. And we do see that, I mean, hints are useful. For, for instance, for SCH bench, 
in, in most cases, except the overloaded case, we do see that when you provide the hint to uh, you know a fine uh, during the fork time, that is, you wake up the messengers and uh, the workers close together on the same LLC, you do see consistently that the tail latency is better. So even in the cases where you know in in this case we have 16 CPUs per LLC. So even in the case where you have 32 workers, 64 workers, it is preferable to start them on the same LLC and then let the load balancer sort of spread them out rather than start them far away and then hope that the load balancer or the wake up path consolidate. So this kind of a hint was found to be useful. And then if you give an incorrect hint, like in case you gave a hint that asked it to spread for whatever reason, you do see the negative impact. So it's that's that's the problem with, with, with hints. Like you are really uh, assuming that uh, the user knows what what they they want, and, it, and if they want to shoot themselves in the foot, that's, that's word. Yeah. So, uh, just where do these hints hurt more? Right. I mean, in a system that's more loaded, in a system that's less loaded, uh, on a heavily loaded system, would something like fork a fine be more useful than a less loaded system? So, on a on a more heavily loaded system for SCH bench fork affine is not useful. We can see that in the 256 case where you know pushing everything, consolidate everything to the single LLC was bad, right? So it, it you, I mean, we are really assuming at this point in time that the work, workload, when it's asking for a hint, it really knows what it's asking for. So whereas, I mean, something like where it, it, it can say that, hey, I am a, uh, a, I, I am a, a heavily loaded system and in case, you can explore beyond an LLC domain when you want to wake up a, a task that, that allows you to spread faster, right? Uh, SD wake balance, which we used to have at one point in time, uh, that may help in the heavily loaded systems if that's the hint that, that you want to provide. But like I said, I mean, the implementation makes sure that if, if there are no idle cores during the wake up or uh, during the initial task placement in, in the choice that we have, we ignore the hints. We, we don't take the hints and we fall back to what the scheduler is currently doing. This is only beneficial when uh, it is it is possible to find, for you to find an idle core. That's what we use as a cutoff point to decide, hey, when do we ignore the hints? And similarly for Hackbench and Tbench, we see that for Hackbench, you know, uh, affining both during the initial placement as well as during the subsequent wake up was helpful. Uh, and spreading it out was not so helpful. Whereas for T-Bench, spreading it out uh, uh, during uh, uh, the initial placement was much more beneficial, especially for the higher uh, threat counts there, higher higher work accounts. Sorry. So another question, right? What is what is the ideal distribution? I mean, can you can you think about the ideal distribution and maybe pin stuff and give us a difference? Uh, can you repeat that? What is the ideal distribution? The ideal solution would, would be for the scheduler to know. No, 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 not the ideal solution. Ideal distribution, right? If if you could, knowing the information you know, like mm -hmm. this, what's going to happen, say this is where you must wake up. This is where you must um, be placed initially, which you could probably do by pinning and run an experiment to know. Right, right, right. So, so, so for instance, let's take the SH bench case. If you chose the case where you said, hey, I'm going to pin everything. Uh, uh, together in, in, in the 256 case, especially in the uh, cases where you have high utilization. Uh, when we pinned, we saw that when the number of clients were greater than the number of CPUs available, the tail latencies were terrible. So you could pin in certain situations where you, you know, uh, have more number of CPUs than you have the number of uh, tasks. But again, that's, that's something that you have to do for each task that the uh, workload provides. Whereas here, the way we have implemented is you uh, provide the hint using PRCTL and when you subsequently fork, the, the children inherit the hint provided by the parent. So in terms of consumability, that, that gets passed down. And we are assuming that the children would like to have the same kind of hint that the parent has unless they, they choose to change it. Yeah, so uh, we wanted to present this to see, you know, what would be the right uh, approach uh, going forward. Uh, something like user space hints, uh, useful. Can we, you know, uh, explore a wider range of tasks, wider range of workloads? Because given the situation that we have, I mean, the current heuristics are simply not working. And I don't know whether we would want to add any more heuristics.
think we are yeah out of time. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank, thank you. you.